Raffalo's book. Uh, Dr. Raffalo's book, Digital Divisions, How Schools Create Inequality in the Tech Era. I'll get things started with a summary of the book. So Digital Divisions focuses on something that, were it not for the current pandemic and all of us here on Zoom, might at first glance seem secondary to the core function of schools. But with so many schools now online, it seems more obvious that technology is important. But the question is how? To answer this, the book interrogates the ways that schools engage with digital technologies that help to sustain social hierarchies by race and class, contributing to social reproduction in the digital age. Specifically, Matt follows how three middle schools make sense of technologies and their use among students. He follows teens at Heathcliff Academy, an affluent and predominantly white private school, Sheldon Junior High, a middle class and primarily Asian public school, and Cesar Chavez Middle School, a public school serving mostly working class Latinx students. Chapter one provides a portrait of each of these schools. All three are technologically endowed, so issues of access are not the focus of this book. However, what is the focus is the fact that the three schools understand and use a similar array of devices in drastically different ways. Chapter two, explores students' digital skill development through students' playful pursuits, which Matt and other scholars, including my own work, argue are critical to their technological abilities. He also importantly shows how teachers at each of the three schools discipline, that is how they structure and value students' digital play. While privileged white students Digital engagements are transformed into valued currency at Heathcliff. Working class and minoritized students' digital production is deemed irrelevant to learning at Chavez and threatening at Sheldon. Chapter three, which I will admit that I enjoyed most of all, examines the origins of these very different ways that teachers understand and value students' play. Matt argues very effectively that it is the school context as a workplace that shapes how teachers view their students, particularly with regard to race and class. At Heathcliff, where teachers were primarily influenced by their concerns about pleasing wealthy white parents, teachers invited students' digital play into school and taught them to leverage their online efforts for current and future reward, like entry into college. In fact, such practices like posting videos produced by students also helped the school project an innovative image for parents. At Chavez, where teachers upheld a family-like community based on the school's history and conversion from an elementary to a middle school, teachers maintained a paternalistic view of their low-income Latinx students and promoted vocational digital skill development to help students enter lower status technical jobs. They also viewed students' digital play as something that should be siloed to outside of school. Finally, at Sheldon, the school environment was one of every person for themselves, where bullying would happen between teachers, between teachers and students, and among students. And students were ridiculed publicly by their teachers who thought of their middle-class Asian students as cutthroat and threatening hackers. Chapter four goes on to explain how these experiences in school then influenced how students thought about their tech, uh, digital play, and in particular, how it could be leveraged as currency in education and occupations. 
because of very different messaging about legitimate and appropriate use of technologies in school, Heathcliff students were very aware of how their range of digital uses, including LinkedIn and Twitter, might be perceived, especially by colleges. And remember, these are middle school students using LinkedIn. As Nathan, a white 14-year-old student at Heathcliff said, quote, getting good grades is just the first step of doing well here. There's a lot of pressure to act as if you're like the next top this or that. It feels like you won't get into college unless you're a really good student and have a million Twitter followers too. At Chavez, students did learn uh, what teachers viewed as basic skills like programming, presentation software, media production. But they viewed their digital play as their teachers described, irrelevant to schooling. Therefore, students oriented their very impressive creative production, like creating songs and hosting them on SoundCloud, towards their peers, and not as leverage for getting into college and other kinds of institutional reward. Finally, at Sheldon, it sounds like everyone just tried to keep their head down and not get caught in the crossfire, where they found ways of eluding teachers' constant surveillance. In the conclusion, Matt deftly ties all, all these threads together, revisiting the overall question of how schools imagine the value and uses of digital technologies and how that influences what children do. He concludes with possible interventions, ways that teachers and schools, and even technologies themselves, can increase the chances that young people can see the value of what they do and, as Matt so eloquently puts it, enact their creative worth online and offline. Overall, what I see as the contribution of this book is adding a layer of complexity to how we understand technology in schools, not as a mere add-on or efficient content delivery system, but rather as a way that schools contribute to racial and socioeconomic inequality in the digital age. It also points to the clear importance of organizational context in creating, maintaining, or exacerbating these inequalities, and how important it is to think of schools as workplaces that shape how teachers enact, however unintentionally, fundamentally racist and classist practices. Finally, the book points to, the, to a lack of neutrality in technologies. There are no magic bullet and enter into highly unequal social dynamics. Their use, therefore, is not just a simple question of overcoming digital divides, but rather part of ongoing contestations over who and what is valued. Now, Matt very aptly said at the end of the book, quote, a careful reader will notice that many of the phenomena described in this book could occur without digital technology present as well. And I certainly thought the same as I read, even as someone deeply interested in technology and inequality. But as Matt points out, the book really tests the theory that social inequalities are a result of students' origins, shaped by the families into which children are born, but in a contemporary context. In doing so, the book points out the critical role that schools play in shaping ideas, uh, in shaping students' ideas about themselves and their futures in the tech era, regardless of their actual skill. So, my take on the book is everyone should read it. If you're an academic, especially one who teaches about or does research on education or culture or inequality, who wants to bring conversations about these dynamics into the present moment, 
this is the book for you. Or if you work in a school like I did before becoming a professor, you should take a look and ask yourself, are you reflected in these pages? If so, is that or is that not acceptable? And what can be done to change it? My one question for Matt that perhaps he can think about and answer during the Q&A is this. Are the ways that Heathcliff Academy engages students' interest in schools and reorients them towards leveraging their digital play for advantage, something that we really want to promote? In such a competition, someone always has to fail. So what would be a more equitable vision for the future? So now I'd like to invite Matt to share some of the book with us. Thank you, Cassidy. Thank you, Ryan and um, Janice and everybody in the room for coming. I'm just pretty overwhelmed. Uh, it feels a little like a blur, just this whole process. And um, every one of you has been a really important part of the reason why I do this. So um, uh, I think next I'm going to read a favorite section of mine from the book. I know usually it's tradition to do like a fancy panel where people far smarter than I weigh in over and over for the whole talk. Obviously, Cassidy fits that. Um, that uh, quality for sure. Um, but instead I thought too, I would just kind of read uh, something fun. And I do love a lively chat. So feel free to use that just for fun and to hang out in addition to asking questions. All right, so here we go. One of my first visits to Heathcliff Academy was to observe Miss Lawson's sixth grade history class. Heathcliff, a private school located in Southern California, had a hefty ticket for entry. With no available scholarships, this limited enrollment to the wealthy and white families living in its vicinity. The flow of income allowed the school to buy and provide iPads to all of its students. Not only could students use them in class, but they could take them home too. In this particular class, students were using iPads to work on a project where they explained and critiqued an international news story. All right, my little historians, exclaimed Miss Lawson, let's take those iPads out. It's time to continue work on our news presentation. Students all reached into their bags and turned their tablets on. And as I peeked at a nearby student's screen, I watched as she opened Keynote which is a slideshow presentation app uh, native to Apple devices. Ms. Lawson walked around the room to help a few students find and open this application to get ready for the activity. You all know what to do, she said. Your final presentation is due next week. The classroom was, for the most part, relatively quiet as students swiped and tapped around on their iPad screens. But just a few minutes into the working session, a loud pop beat blasted from a student's iPad and cut through the silence. I quickly realized that the sound was coming from that same nearby student that I was observing. She rapidly swiped across the screen to, to close the music video by uh, Katy Perry, a pop musician some of you may have heard of. The class chuckled and even Miss Lawson cracked a smile. Juliana, she said knowingly, I hope Miss Perry will be making an appearance in your news presentation next week. Juliana grinned and nodded. Miss Lawson turned to the rest of the class. Folks, if what you're doing makes noise, please keep the volume low or at least pull out some earphones. Shortly thereafter, I noticed some students actually swiping to their own web browser to look up images of their own favorite pop musicians, some even copying and pasting photos into their presentations too. A few short weeks later, I made my first visit to Sheldon Junior High to observe Miss Bartow's sixth grade music class. She told me beforehand that they were using software to learn how to compose music for a class project. Although only a 40 minute drive from Heathcliff, the school served a very different student population. Once an area for predominantly white families, 
the outlying neighborhood had rapidly shifted in the past 10 years to accommodate an influx of Asian American immigrant families, mostly middle class. Their children increasingly populated the school district. Though Sheldon was a public school, its teachers and administrators went to considerable lengths to ensure that up-to-date digital technologies were readily available for instruction. This was certainly apparent when I visited to observe Ms. Bartow's classroom. Arriving first, I made my way to the edge of the room and I sat in a chair with a view of the whole space. Looking around, I counted five sections with four pristine computers in each section. Their monitors were large and high resolution, not unlike those I see professional designers, of whom some are, are here, thank you, but not unlike those I see professional designers use in my own work in the tech industry. A young man clad in a jean vest and rainbow sneakers, I loved those rainbow sneakers, walked into the room not long after I sat down. He passed me on the way to his seat, pausing to introduce himself as Luke. This class is great, he said in a poorly delivered whisper. My song is gonna be the best. He eventually took his seat in front of a computer and just before the bell rang, Miss Bartow and the remaining students shuffled into the room and sat down at their desks. Okay, everybody, Miss Bartow said, let's get to it. I looked around as students put on headphones and opened their work. Their screens were filled with horizontal lines and they dragged and dropped little music notes to form their compositions. I was astonished at how quiet this room was for a music class aside from a constant staccato of computer mouse clicks. Students repeatedly played back their compositions as they revised them, but their headphones muffled the noise almost entirely. Miss Bartow waved me over to her desk, indicating that she wanted to show me something on her computer. Get a load of this, she said. I saw roughly 20 tiny boxes arranged on her screen, screen, and upon a closer look, I realized that they were all miniature versions of computer screens. They were moving in real time. Isn't this wild, she said. I can watch what they're doing on their computers, and I don't even have to patrol around the room. Indeed, the screens look not too different from a series of surveillance cameras. Students mostly seem to be using the music composition software for their class project. Look here, she said, pointing to one of the tiny windows. She clicked it and expanded it into a, a larger screen. It showed a hip hop music video playing in a small browser of the student's screen. Watch this, she said with a smirk. Miss Bartow then stood up from her chair and yelled, hey, Luke, stop watching that video and get back to work. Luke was stunned. After a moment, I could see from Miss Bartow's expanded screen that Luke had closed the music video. He quickly got back to work on music composition. What's particularly interesting about these examples is that both of these sixth grade classes were focused on a creative activity for learning. At Heathcliff, students were using uh, digital tools to create a presentation about the news. And at Sheldon, they were working on a music project using music composition software. Both classes had the latest digital technology to complete their activities. Both classes had classroom time that was designed to be used for independent work. But the similarities ended there. This same activity, a student opening a music video, was interrupt was sorry, interrupted, was interpreted by both teachers differently. Although the class itself was centered on making music, Ms. Bartow publicly sanctioned students for watching music videos for fun, even if it didn't distract other students. Ms. Lawson, however, incorporated students' broad interests in digital media into their news projects. These teachers were not alone in their digital approaches. As I documented classroom life at both schools over the course of an academic year, I found that disciplining digital play in this way was the go-to pedagogical practice at Sheldon Junior High, whereas actively incorporating kids' digital pursuits online into academic work was commonplace at Heathcliff Academy. Why did teachers 
construct the value of similar technologies and kids' digital play so differently. As I carried out this project, adding even another middle school for comparison, I tried to sort this out. Although I have always been a bit of a technophile, as I'm sure many of you in the room know, I have been leery of public perception of digital technologies as a magic bullet to address the ills of society. Social science showed me that a host of structures can impose barriers to educational equity even before laptops and social media entered the equation. I believe that a researcher who visits digital era schools will still observe, as I did, many hallmarks from classic studies of day-to-day -day school life. When school bells ring, a campus rapidly transforms from a silent sanctuary into a bustling hub powered by an energetic, swift-moving crowd. Teachers share idle gossip in the faculty lounge. Students cluster off during lunchtime and chat variously about homework and the latest peer dramas. But the contemporary ethnographer will notice some significant differences from school ethnographies of even a decade ago. Digital technologies are everywhere. Nearly all students and faculty carry mobile devices like smartphones, and classrooms are increasingly equipped with computers and even interactive uh, whiteboards. In the words of one teacher, internet access is like oxygen. Play is a subject of theoretical interest for philosophers, educators, and contemporary technologists. Plato argued that play is the best means by which children learn voluntarily, voluntarily law-abiding mores. Johann Huizinga, writing on ancient cultures, saw play as among the purest aesthetic events, a means to express the capacity of the mind and leave one's mark on the world. This mark on society, as play theorists suggest, is essentially innovation. It's no surprise then that play periodically emerges in history as a valued social practice for learning and introducing novelty even in business. What I take from play theorists is that play as a social practice represents engagement with social structure. It is a process through which people can go under the hood of a car and see if even for a moment, what makes society work? Take, for example, a young person playing SimCity 2000, for those of us old enough to remember this game. It's one of the best games of all time, I think. What the game was is a city building simulation experience. And in a study of the game's use for learning, there's one scene where a young person tries to play the game to save money for his city by cutting all tax revenue from, for public services, like fire departments. Although this kid enjoyed short-term gains in city, uh, city income, he found himself at a complete loss when a fire in a corner of his city was uncontainable. And as a result, he suffered more financial losses in the long term. Gameplay presented opportunities to see relationships between social structure, like financial policies and government entities, and outcomes like urban disasters. Players, too, can hit the reset button and start over to imagine a new reality with different structures in place that govern city life. Rarely in our day-to-day -day lives do we have the luxury of a reset button. Games can provide players with sociological foresight. I ultimately argue that the way educational institutions cultivate innovators is through their capacity to discipline play. Digital youth culture is rich with new ideas, forms, and styles, but schools set the terms for whether students can mobilize their playful pursuits for achievement, and they do so differently by student class and race. At schools serving primarily working class and middle class youth of color, teachers communicate to students that their digital play is not helpful to learning. But at a school serving primarily wealthy and white students, teachers communicate to them that their digital play is essential to learning and achievement. Thus, teachers treat kids similar forms of digital play quite differently with consequences for school achievement. Education reformers, practitioners, and families who want the best for young people are keen 
to prioritize the closing of digital divides at school in order to maximize students' potential. Adults probably assume that these kids these days, you know, will pay more attention in class and learn key digital skills if more high quality education technologies are available. But we know less about how innovation works than we think. It's not just about the skills. Schools organize the sandboxes within which ideas get circulated, elevated, or shot down. Thanks for listening. Thank you, Matt. That was wonderful. And I do encourage everyone whoops, to go and pick up your copy. Mine now has lots and lots of uh, sticky notes on it, which won't surprise my students at all. Um, let's go now into uh, Q&A. Um, and we got a whole bunch of wonderful questions in the chat. I encourage everyone to um, ask a question. Uh, Although these might come up, uh, uh, let me just make sure that I've got everyone's on there. Okay, so, um, so we've got a bunch of questions here about your, uh, the origins of your study and the origins of the book. Um, and I really like this question. So, um, uh, da, 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 da. so first, what inspired you to write this book, right? So. And, and we'll get into how you went about like starting into the study, but what about the book? Was it just like you wanted to write a book and, or, or was it a handful of things that you put together? Or what inspired you to, to, to write a book? Totally. Um, so uh, first, I was always a gamer as a kid. I grew up in a time when being into technology labeled you as kind of a geek and not in a good way. Um, and I was so fortunate that my parents, thank you mom and dad for being here and supporting me, um, really encouraged those interests. Um, whether or not I was getting signals from peers or even school that they were necessarily valuable. And so one of the things I was so curious about as all of us have watched digital technologies become so ubiquitous is have things changed at all? Like were things different? Like what, what's, what are worlds like? What's school like when technologies are woven into the fabric of your schooling? Said, and so, uh, your parents could never beat you in any video game <laughs> on the chat. Sorry to interrupt. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not gonna lie, that might be true. I was gonna say <laughs> no, but, uh, but thank you for your support. Um, so that was a big part of it. I also think that coming uh, into, you know, in schooling, I had the benefit of such great mentors, Abigail, Abigail Cheever, who, thank you so much for being here, really got me started in thinking about cultural theory back when I was doing, uh, uh, majored in literature, for which I am indebted uh, to my study of social science. That thinking has helped me so much. Um, Del McWhorter also uh, really helped me with this. Uh, Cynthia Fosiano, Francesca Paletta, everybody that I worked with in graduate school and beyond introduced me to ethnographic work that just opened my eyes to what this writing could look like and the power of uh, ethnographic research. And Prudence, Prudence Carter's work, Angela Valenzuela's work, Paul Willis. Um, um, yeah, I mean, when I started reading work by these folks, I was like, wow, I hope, I hope I can do something that aspires to be just as cool. And so, yeah, that, that kind of mix just led to all of us. Okay, so give us, give us a sense of, you know, your, and this is a question that came up in the chat. You're a grad student, you are inspired by these, you know, sociological books that are about inequality, and you go to approach schools. So, well, you know, was it, did you make it clear to the schools, the administrators and the teachers or even students that your intention was to research inequality? Yeah, so, um, uh, yeah, so 
as part of the process for entry, and there have been a lot of good um, examples. Uh, there's one book, I think, called Journeys Through Ethnography um, that Annette LaRoe and uh, some colleagues of hers co-edited, where they provide some examples of just how challenging it is to get into schools. I mean, any qualitative researcher will tell you it's tough. Um, so basically what I did is I, and uh, I think a lot of people know in the room that I can be a little bit, I don't know if neurotic is the right word, aggressive, assertive, organized. I think organized is probably the kinder way to put it. I reached out to every single middle school in a 50 mile radius from where I studied because I was determined to do this work. I wanted to get into schools. And at the time I hadn't really, you know, and this is a benefit of field work is that I hadn't really, I didn't really know exactly what I wanted to study. I knew what different literature said that I should expect in the classroom. And so I, I essentially framed it to schools. Like I wanted to learn um, what it's like using technologies at school. What are the benefits? What are the costs? What works well? What doesn't? Um, and a lot of this just kind of came up in the field. Um, and it was because of the benefits of the people that were training me and my friends and colleagues that were helping me process what I was observing, which is the real fun and beauty of the discovery process of field work, as you know, Cassidy, um, that I came to the conclusions of this work, was directed to literatures that I needed to interface with, with the things that I was finding. Um, and yeah, it just kind of came to be that way. So since you've um, left the field sites and published the book, have you uh, shared it with them, gone back? Any response from the schools or teachers? That is a very good question. Uh, something that I really toiled with while I was in the field, because for those who will read the book, um, I mean, I'm just gonna be honest, like, People, people were very willing to share some incredibly racist and classist stuff. Um, and I think that white folks, when around other white folks, feel comfortable to do so. And that was a benefit of my entry point to be able to witness some of these things. And at the time when I was thinking about the conclusions that I had made, I, it wasn't clear to me that the findings would be received in a way that would be productive. I didn't see them, you know, a lot of the work is about, you know, building on colorblind, theories of colorblindness, which argue that white folks will say really offensive stuff, but then almost pretend or be unaware that they say these things. And so based on my own field work, I expected that they would do the same thing. Now looking back, um, and I, I actually think that I didn't get training like this to hold meetings and convert my findings into stuff that is actually digestible by anyone but academics. I, I actually thank my colleagues at Google for training me in how to render sometimes really difficult stuff into things that are productive for dialogue. And so something that I'm doing right now is trying to think about like how I would reorganize some of these findings into a way that actually could help start conversations. And there are people that do this for their jobs that do this kind of organization level work like CCEJ, um, who I'll just plug, I'm donating all of my um, book proceeds to for the next year that does school anti-racism work. They do this stuff. They are experts at this stuff. And so um, I really hope to spend really my time now working with folks like that to learn how to do some of this sharing back better and do it with mind to productive change. So we've got a bunch of really great questions about the context of your study. Um, it was in Southern California. Um, and and in three very particular schools, they were very, you know, technologically endowed. Um, I loved hearing about uh, the smart boards where students would share work and, and accidentally share in other classrooms. Um, <laughs> it was like, that's definitely a first world problem. Um, so 
he, the question that I have is, um, and, and others in the chat have posted are, you know, how does this generalized to other schools? Are there like particular demographic areas where there's more of these issues? Um, how might the findings change in other contexts? Yep. Um, and I just saw Martha's question, did I change anyone's name? So very important principle of social science research. Everything is pseudonymized. Everyone's a pseudonym. Um, so all of that, uh, uh, is done to protect the participants and the school names as well. Um, so I think the generalizability thing is a super, super important question. Um, I absolutely can generalize to the schools that I studied, but I can't say that I can generalize what I observed exactly at these schools would happen in other schools. But what I can say, and this is the tremendous benefit of, I think, what sociology offers to the world, which is our research design training, weighing the costs and benefits of quantitative and qualitative work, is that qualitative work is really good at testing and building on known theories, like the ones that I engage with in this book, uh, we refer to as like theories of unequal childhoods or cultural mobility. Um, and in this case, what I'm able to do is show how race and racism illuminate a gap in our current thinking, which is primarily social class focused in um, cultural research um, and education. Um, but it also is really great low hanging fruit for me to do or me to collaborate with quantitative or mixed methods researchers to just test how common these phenomena are in many other environments. And so I now have some really good hunches of aspects that I think the literature has missed, but it would require further work. Um, and I can talk about some ideas for what that work could look like if folks are curious um, to really kind of map out uh, things further. And I will note um, one of the biggest limitations is that, um, and this is really important, is that there weren't uh, a lot of black students in the schools that I studied. Um, which is a very, very big gap, um, fruitful for a lot of uh, future work on tech use on this front. And I have some hunches based on some, you know, there were a few black students at one of the schools where there was some really interesting and um, strange teacher dynamics there that I think uh, would be interesting to explore. Um, but yeah, that is a really important limitation that I wanted to call out. Yeah, I think that um, just as a follow up to this question, I mean, we got like several questions about this particular um, topic. So, you know, yep. in schools where they might be able to bring their own technologies and sort of avoid being surveilled and um, mm -hmm. what, what it might look for, uh, look like with poor kids in wealthier settings or um, sort of that within school uh, stratification. Um, in honors classes versus lower tracked kids or um, yeah I think those are you know they run, yep. they run the gamut of questions about that but, but what do you think about about those things did you see any any of those um, kind of uh, tracking <laughs> dynamics in these schools or yeah yep yep so um, at Sheldon Junior High where um, and if we want to talk about the workplace dynamic stuff, we can, but like the teacher workplace there, teachers described it as a hellhole. Um, I'm sure some of us in this room have had that experience on the job. Basically, they described other women at the school as like mean girls, like they wouldn't let you sit with them at lunch. And those threatening dynamics among teachers shaped how they saw their students and saw their students in racialized ways. Um, so they drew on kind of hacker imagery of Asian American students rather than quote unquote model minorities where they would describe Asian students they taught elsewhere. They saw the few Latinx students at that school as quite literally future gang members um, rather than these kind of benevolent immigrants that um, these, st these stereotypes that they were juggling um, at other schools. Um, but the effect that that had was that they then saw digital technologies as an extension of that threat day-to-day -day experience on the job. They used technologies to discipline and punish, to surveil and track students. Like that stunning example in that 
sixth grade music class. Like, why do you need surveillance cameras in a sixth grade music class for crying out loud? <laughs> um, but one of the really interesting things is that, you know, students aren't powerless. Students find ways to resist. And at that school in particular, um, a lot of students talk to me about this practice of ghosting. Um, I don't know if any of you have heard of this, but it's essentially, and it's, I think ghosting might be more slang than it is the technical term for this um, use of digital tools, but essentially they used their digital skills to hide from surveillance. They would use tools to go incognito, to act like ghosts in the background and avoid the punishment of their teachers. But, but what's crazy is that in resisting by hiding, they are still reproducing the broader issue, which is their playful pursuits are not allowed to be seen at school. And in fact, as I find, they're even hiding what they do online outside of school for fear of teacher reprimand. Um, so, you know, students, I mean, young people can be super clever. And I would think that that's a pretty clever illustration of digital skills by doing that work. But of course, the organizational environment inhibited it. Um, you did mention another question is just like, how might it, might it work at different types of schools? Um, I got a lot of questions about this, different kind of demographic groups. Um, again, I think it's hard to generalize beyond the work that I did, but I do have some hunches. So um, one, one kind of configuration of schools that we've talked about is what about an, you know, an all-white kind of lower income school, for example. I think something that I learned from this work and from others' work is that the invisibility of whiteness, and what I mean by that is you know, the teachers, white, these predominantly white teachers I talk to, they have available stereotypes about um, minoritized students that they're getting from somewhere in the world. You know, I can't track where that's from with this work, but they, they have them available to them. Um, but they don't have these stereotypes for white students. And that is a privilege of whiteness. They are protected from being a lumped in to an entire racial ethnic category to categorize either their failures or their successes. And so that is a broad privilege that white students would benefit from at an all white school, even if it's lower income. However, I do think that teacher dynamics would have a big impact. If it's a hostile workplace, they might um, draw on classist stereotypes about white students to explain how they would um, use those digital tools. Um, or they just might draw on class stereotypes, even if it's, you know, depending on the, on what happens at the school, you know, if a particular event happens, that's really scary, like, you know, really scary, like a student's playing Grand Theft Auto in class, you know, what are we going to do, you know, it might invoke some of this um, stuff. Um, so we can talk about that more, but it's just, just, just something I've been thinking about broadly. Okay, so um, how about this question, which I love, which is also related to your methodology, your findings. Um, if you were doing your research now <laughs> with remote learning, <laughs> right? What do you think you, like, well, first of all, what would you change maybe about your research questions, your methodology. Um, and then I'm curious, what do you think you might find? Or, or what do you think that people doing research who are here in the room, uh, what they might do and investigate? So that's a really great question and a really great segue to just what all of us who study digital tech are thinking about right now is like, oh my gosh, what does this all mean for living in a pandemic? I don't think any of us expected people to care about technology because of the pandemic. Um, sometimes it's a struggle to get social scientists to care about digital tools, but this was not the way we all wanted it to go. Um, but what would I do? Well, I would first say that research should absolutely not stop, especially qualitative work. There are many, many people out there in fields outside of sociology uh, and anthropology and HCI and other fields that have really, um, refined what it means to do digitally, uh, use digital means for qualitative data collection. 
I would be interviewing people. I would be observing Zoom classrooms. I would be um, talking to students and trying to understand how all the different entry points for different school members, what their experience is like in this shift to online learning, um, both from a, a point of view of digital access, which I think is exacerbated certainly in an all online school experience. And that cannot be understated because remember pre-COVID, I mean, Cassidy, you and I have talked about like the question was, should digital tech even be in classroom at all? Like a phone, I mean, um, and now you, you need digital tech to be in class. And so um, it's almost a, a bit of a, a different access paradigm. However, um, I'm very worried about what online learning experiences look like right now. Um, I expect that a lot of the stuff that I observed in the classroom in terms of how racial, particularly racial ideology and its intersection with class um, uh, inequities will persist online. I mean, look no for further than these like ridiculous Zoom rules that we're seeing about dress codes. I mean, we're all, all of us are wearing pajamas right now, at least from waist down, you know, like, like these rules that we're seeing, like dress codes, the surveillance tools people are using to prevent cheating. I mean, we're in a pandemic for crying out loud. And I would wager that a lot of these dress codes are not for privileged white students. I would bet anything that that's the case. Um, further, and there's been a lot of interesting um, discussion of this by uh, researchers far uh, uh, smarter than I, about teaching pods. These kind of pods basically where folks, families that can afford them will um, buy the services sometimes of uh, tutors or even teachers to do homeschooling or um, more kind of practice with smaller groups of, of people that, that can quarantine together. And essentially what that does is it removes privileged families from the environment that many public schools are in right now where teachers are wholly under supported. They don't have the technology skill training that they need. They don't even feel safe half the time if they have to teach in person. Um, and so there's no way they can deliver on what can be amazing online learning given that situation. And so what privileged families are doing is removing their students from this, um, which uh, I think uh, removes really important entry points for all families to be invested in providing good public schooling to students, no matter where you're from, no matter how you're entering the class um, and make it as great as it can be. Well, thank you for that. It's. Um, do you have any any additional words if, if for maybe grad students uh, in the room? Uh, anything you would suggest to them? <laughs> what you know? Where should they be going? What should they be doing? Yeah, I mean, I don't know how much things have changed, but I think there's a lot of academics who still. No offense to those in the room who either don't understand or don't believe that studying this stuff is important. I think that's changing, but it is a little bit of an uphill battle. Um, I would trust your gut. I would trust your gut that what you're studying matters. I would trust your gut in documenting the things that you're seeing. And I would think of your discussions with perhaps more senior faculty as experiences where you'll benefit from their expertise, but you'll, you'll win them over eventually um, because the field will benefit from your work. Um, and your efforts on that front. So that would be my advice. Great. Okay, so we only have time for one more question. And um, well, I think that the the question is essentially, and I, I wanted to get to your parents' question, so it's going to be a, a big question, which is Good. basically yeah. about, you know, the vision for the future, right? So what can be done as we move forward, what can parents, teachers, schools do, um, or tech, how can tech play a role? I'm, I'm specifically going to say what your parents posted, which is what is the next step for researchers to move the needle on teacher development and empowerment with respect to technology? Um, how do we support educators to reflect 
and more importantly, act on harmful biases and prejudices that discourage young people of marginalized backgrounds to engage in digital play that matters to them. Yeah, and I'll, I'll use this as an opportunity, I think, to get to your, your question too, Cassidy, that you yes. had asked too, which is a little <laughs> like, like, what do we do, you know? Um, so uh, I'm gonna like nerd out a little bit because I'm gonna mention Marx. Um, but Marx has said a lot, he's taught me a lot about thinking about creativity and the matter, how creativity matters, of course, to your development and growth as a student and beyond. But one thing that I think Marx misses, um, he doesn't spell it out very well, is that our creative work always has an audience. Um, sometimes we make things for our family. Sometimes it's our friends. Sometimes it's school, as in the case of what I studied. Um, but as I noticed at Heathcliff, you know, the way that they taught that your, what your creativity amounts to is to be this elite, like Harvard going, no offense to Harvard, like that's how your creative work matters. And it was kind of eerie talking to these students where it just felt like every little moment was an opportunity to talk about their hipster idea and like this one student who was like, oh yeah, I'm really into gymnastics, but I compete nationally. And I was like, really? Like, okay. So I think, I think what would be interesting, and this is something that I'm thinking about a lot of my new work on YouTubers, is the role that institutions play in communicating to us who your audience is, who it should be. Should it be elite colleges? Should it be your family and friends? Should it be your community? Should your innovation actually be, should schools help cultivate a vision of how your innovative capacity gives back to your community? That's where I think a lot of the value is here in what schools can do to harness that creative power for giving back um, to the people you care about and to your broader um, network. I will also say that there is a lot of work us white folks need to do to work on each other and work on ourselves in confronting the hard reality that we grow up in a racist society. We are reproducing racial ideology and we need to identify that in ourselves, um, unpack it and work through it if we want any hope to help make the world a better place. So that's what I would say about that, I think. Thank you, Matt. Unfortunately, that is all the time that we have. Thank you everyone for your very thoughtful questions and wonderful discussions. In conclusion, I encourage you, if you haven't already, to run out and buy the <laughs> book and read it. Now, Matt is kindly donating book proceeds in the first year to the California Conference for Equality and Justice a school anti-racism organization serving Southern California where he did the study. And graduate students, don't forget to enter the raffle for a copy of the book, which we're posting again. Here is the link. And Matt, why don't you close us out? So I wanna thank Janice for captioning, Cassidy for this amazing and unbelievably incredible. Um, I don't even know what to say. Thank you, Cassidy. <laughs> um, <laughs> Ryan, for all of your work on promotions. Elizabeth, my editor, for believing in this project from the beginning. My parents, um, my sister, Jenna, and her husband, Bryant. And of course, my partner, Emmanuel. Um, and everyone for being here and supporting this from beginning to end. Thank you so much for coming and thank you for being here. Bye, y'all. Yay.